Well, last week, we kicked off uh, our Christmas series called Divine Interruption. And we were looking at God's plan versus our plans. And sometimes the challenge and uh, kind of the conflict of that, as we so much want to do our thing, and then we begin to realize that God has purposes and plans that are good. And can we trust him in that? And how God's plan is often something that we, we didn't even expect, couldn't even see, and it interrupts the plans that we've made for ourselves. And so in this series, we're looking at the, the divine interruption, which was Jesus himself. But often God brings those interruptions to us. And again, the question is, will we trust him in the middle of that interruption and that, that break that somehow changes uh, my life plan and my life schedule? Now, I know when I use the word interrupt, our tendency is to think kind of negative, that an interruption is, is always this kind of, negative part of us. But, but last week, if you were here, we talked about there are bad interruptions, but there are also really good interruptions that often change the course of our lives. We look back on those and say, I'm so glad that happened. I'm so glad that intersected this place that I was at. And when God interrupts us, we realize over and over and over again, we can go through the Bible again and again and again. It is always for good. Because maybe his interruption for us was to connect our hearts with his heart. Maybe that interruption was so that our plans could kind of make way for his plans. Maybe it's to realign us in a way. Because if you're like me, there are times and seasons in life when we just, you know, it's not this big thing, it's just this little variance from what God wants to do, what he wants to speak, how he wants to move in my life. And I keep doing my own thing. And sometimes that interruption is bringing us back into alignment, drawing us near again to God's heart. So last week we looked at several things that he interrupts us when we get too complacent. We just have kind of settled in. He interrupts us to bring light into those dark places in our life because he is the author of light. So the Bible tells us. And when he does show up to divinely interrupt us, it, it grabs our attention. It, it, it takes our focus on whatever we were chasing after and it gets us back on him. And we talked about at the time of interruption, God sometimes does that in very specific ways. And we talked about a restless spirit that we sometimes have. We talked about a spoken word, whether it's from God's word or from someone else that, that kind of breaks in to the complacency or sometimes it's even an unusual blessing. And I know there are other ways that God can interrupt us, but I have seen over and over and over again those three things in my own life and in the people around me that are so true, that restless spirit, that spoken word, that unusual blessing. So I wanna read you something uh, after, after last weekend, I had a woman in our church. Her name is Leona Nichols. Many of you know Willis and Leona. They have been here for a very long time. And Leona will periodically write me and, and share what God is doing. And Willis and Leona came out of a religion that was very oppressive, that was very legalistic, that it was, it was very controlling of their lives. And as they as they made that move, and this, this was years and years ago, it, it literally transformed their lives. It, it broke relationships that had been there forever. It was a very difficult thing that I would, I would guess most of us in this room haven't experienced something exactly like they went through. But in the process of that, it's been amazing to watch God do this uh, incredible work through Leona to people who have been caught and bound by rules and traditions and by legalism that has, that has left them far from the heart of God instead of living in freedom. And so Leona just wrote this to me and I just, I just wanna read it to you. She says, Pastor Dave, I just wanna comment on some points in the message yesterday that were so significant to me. All three points were reminders of God's interruption in my life and in Willis's. First, she says, we were complacent in our belief that we were part of the only one true church. And when he stopped us in our tracks by interrupting our prayer together in our living room to reveal his infinite love and concern for us and to give us his joy, we immediately realized that there was more to serving God than we had ever been taught or ever experienced. 
By the way, Leona gave me permission to read this in case you were wondering. Uh, The second thing, she says, when God interrupts, darkness becomes light, which was our second thing we looked at. She said, that was so true for us. The following morning after this encounter they had, as we spent nearly the entire morning with open Bibles and saying to each other, I didn't even know the Bible said that, did you? And she has told me again and again that that the religion that they were a part of was, was so invasive that that there wasn't this freedom to actually dive into the Bible themselves. And for the first time in her life, she said, all that had been dark around them suddenly came to light as they saw God's word. Then she said, the third one, God's interruption demands my attention. She says, wow, did it ever. Within a week, we had our first minister visit, which means they were in trouble, followed by the second in a few days, after which we decided to go to the third minister and tell him our story which eventually led for them being pushed out and excommunicated from their church. She said, and yes, we experienced all three of the following. A restless spirit meant our eyes had been opened and we knew God had a plan for us. The spoken word was likely all the scriptures that began to come to mind and that we would share with each other in amazement that God's word had come alive to us. And the third and unusual blessing is God began to bring things to light and to speak through our young son, John, in such astonishing ways. By the way, that's our pastor, John, here. Dave, when we think that had God not invaded our lives, we, along with our whole family, would be focused on how we dressed, all the things we were not allowed to do, and withdrawn into our own little world. What an incredible thing it was that God set us free. We are so thankful every day for his grace and provision. And yes, it is all because a baby was born in Bethlehem so long ago. The gratitude we feel for the one who would die on a cross for our sins is immeasurable. Maybe you can relate to that in your own way. That there was this God interruption that changed your life. And maybe you sit here tonight and you look back and you go, I am so glad we welcomed that interruption, that you see it as encouraging and and motivating and exciting as God stepped into your world. But for some of you, maybe here tonight, you're much more reluctant about these God interruptions because the things that have come into your life have flat out been hard. Maybe it was brokenness or sadness or anxiety or heartache. I don't know what it is, but there's there's this fear in there about what God may be wanting to do in you and through you. And can I tell you, I get it. When God moves us into new places, when he begins to do a work in us, there's this little bit of fear because it's like, ah, things are gonna change. Maybe I'm gonna be different. Maybe, maybe he's asking me to walk a path or, or step into a journey that I'm just not too sure about. And it can lead us to those places of fear. Fear and worry have the ability to grip us to the point of of immobilizing us. Fear can stop us in our tracks from from taking that next step. Fear can keep us from making decisions that we need to make. Fear can keep us from going the places that we need to go or connecting with the people who need us or maybe having a needed conversation. Fear can sometimes stall us and God's saying, just trust me a little bit more. Maybe for you, there's some, as we talk about in Celebrate Recovery, a hurt or a habit that is just kind of got you. Maybe that addiction seems to have a, you know, a grip on you and you're so afraid to take that first step. Maybe it's simply the basics of surrendering your life to Jesus. See, God wants you to know that he's got you. That he's got you. That he really is a good father that his goal is not to punish you or lead you astray or take you on this journey and then just abandon you. He says that he will not do that, that he understands your situation. He understands who you are and who he made you to be. And so this weekend, we're gonna be looking at this story of the shepherds on that night that Jesus interrupted humanity and the message the angels gave to them those 2,000 years ago. And at the very beginning of that amazing and divine and angelic announcement, they said this, do not be what? Afraid. Do not be afraid. Back a few years ago, uh, there was a survey that was conducted 
to actually try to look at the first decade of the 2000s, so 2001 to 2010. And, they, and the survey was, how would you characterize those 10 years? They were trying to kind of, what word would you use to kind of define the decade? And you know what the word ended up being in this survey? The word fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of terror, terrorism, fear of pandemics, uh, economic fears, all those things. And this year, this year, as they are kind of, kind of looking through these last several years, they were asked the same questions about what Americans fear the most. Now, I know in a somewhat lighthearted way, we would say things like, I'm really afraid of spiders. I hate snakes. That would be me. Um, maybe a fear of heights. Speaking in public is always like high on the list of, of fears. But do you realize that this year there was something that was on the list that had never been on the list before? And it was in the top five of all fears of Americans. And you know what the fear was? An interruption of services. That was our fear. First world problems, right? We're so afraid of the internet going out, you know? Because for a lot of us here, and I bet this is true of some of you, if you're in an office or a workplace and the internet goes out, you're going, I can't even work. You can't even do anything. And so it was this whole fear that our services were going to be interrupted. In fact, they gave a name for it. It's called nomophobia. That's actually what it's called. And when I looked at that, I thought, where did they get that from? Like no mo, like you have no mo service. And so you get to be afraid of that. We've become so addicted and connected to technology that being disconnected is this deep seated fear. So just in a light moment, I looked up some other phobias that we have. See if you know what any of these are. Ablutophobia, anyone know what that is? It's the fear of bathing. And it's my intense hope that nobody here has that fear that you would be able to bathe. Uh, Catophobia, anyone know what that is? It's the fear of losing your hair. I don't have that one. We're, we're, we're good on that. Oikophobia is the fear of household appliances. You didn't even know that was out there. Some people are deathly afraid. Ergophobia is the fear of the workplace. Some of you know people who are afraid of the workplace. Uh, then this one, uh, decidophobia, which is the fear of making decisions. And my favorite of all times is phobophobia, which is the fear of phobias, right? You're just afraid of all that. But I'll tell you this, in spite of sometimes the phobias or even the everyday fears that we have, even real fears, fears of abandonment, fear of relationships, fear of commitment. We have all kinds of things that, you know, some, some of us are, are really afraid to be alone because of what we, we've experienced in our life, because of things from the past that we just, we just always have to be in the middle of something. Some people are simply afraid of, of life actually going smoothly. Maybe this is some of you, maybe you know someone. So you create your own chaos. You create your own problems. You create your own drama because you don't know what it would be like to live in this place of peace. But I wanna tell you this, regardless of where your fears are, God wants you to know that you don't have to be afraid. In fact, that, that command, do not be afraid, I don't know if you know this, it is the most repeated command in the entire Bible. Do not be afraid. And on that very first Christmas, those angels showed up to some shepherds in the middle of the night while they watched over their sheep and said the same things to them that God is saying to us today. Do not be afraid. So if you're there in Luke chapter two, let's read this story. Mary had already had the baby at this point. Jesus has been born in, in the stable. And, uh, and here's where we pick it up, <clears throat> starting uh, in verse Eight. It says, that night some shepherds were in the fields outside the village, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of God's glory surrounded them. They were terribly frightened, as you can imagine. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem, the city of David. And this is how you will recognize him. You will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God. 
And they said, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to all whom God favors. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they ran to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angels had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and thought about them offered often. And the shepherds went back to their fields and flocks, glorifying and praising God for what the angels had told them. And because they had seen the child just as the angel had said. It's an interesting thing when the angel comes and says, do not be afraid. Because at first glance, and if you look just at the surface, you think, well, of course, guys out watching sheep in the middle of the night and all of a sudden angelic beings flood the sky. Everyone's gonna be a little bit terrified. And so I think this message was twofold. I think the first part was the angel literally saying, We're not here to kill you. We're not here to wipe you out. We're not here to destroy you because there would be this fear of, oh, what are they gonna do to us? And I think it really was to calm their immediate fears. But I think there was a deeper message that was for the shepherds, but it would be for us today. And it's regardless of what you see going on in the world, no matter if you feel that God has abandoned you and left you, because remember, this had been hundreds of years that they had last heard anything about a Messiah and they wondered, did God abandon us? Did he leave us? Has he forgotten us? And the angels step in and say, regardless of where you're at right now and what you're feeling, fear is not what God is for. Fear is not what he's trying to place into your life. You are covered. You are loved. God would say, I've got you in this. It's a powerful message. I don't know if you've ever thought that if this was such a big event, right? If it was so astonishing, then why didn't anyone else see it? Where where was everyone else? If it was that bright and there were that many angels from heaven that showed up, why didn't anyone else report this? Why didn't anyone else make a big deal about it? Here's what I think, because they weren't paying attention. Rome wasn't paying attention. The Roman government wasn't looking for the king of kings anytime soon. People were busy doing life right? The biggest interruption in history and they missed it. They missed it. And I wonder if we sometimes miss what God wants to accomplish. He's come to bring us good news of great joy. Write this down for number one. The good news message is for me too. The good news message is for me too. And that's just not Dave talking about Dave. This is, this is your words. This is what you get to say. This message of good news is for me too. In Luke chapter four, just a couple chapters beyond this, but, but a couple decades later, as, as Jesus was, was an adult and he was entering into his life as a teacher, uh, he stood up in front of kind of the hometown crowd in Luke chapter four and he said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the downtrodden will be freed from their oppressors and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I think it's interesting to contrast the shepherds and the wise men who came to see Jesus. Both were those that were gonna hear good news. Both of those were gonna be free. Both of those had this message that was coming to them. The shepherds were on the low end of the social strata, right? Shepherds were kind of down at the bottom. Shepherds weren't respected very much. In fact, back then, a shepherd had very little even legal standing in a court of law. That's how little was thought of them. These wise men were educated. They were high up on the social ladder. Think about that. Shepherds, poor and uneducated. Wise men, rich and highly educated but both came to Jesus and both had the same reaction to worship him. They couldn't have been more different culturally, but they all came to this place of belief and acceptance by God. You may be the lowest person on the org chart at your work. You may be the CEO. The good news is for you, regardless of where, you've, where you land. You may be a freshman 
or you may be a senior or a grad student, guess what? The good news is for everyone. You may be the recovering addict in your family or you may be the glue that holds your family together. But this good news of freedom and life that the blind will see, that those who are poor will be raised up. That good news is for you. No matter your occupation or your family status, your economic status or your, or your political affiliation, the good news of Jesus Christ is for everyone. Now here's where it gets personal. It says in that passage in Luke 2, I bring you good news of great joy. At the very first Christmas, God was thinking of you. God was thinking of you. You can even personalize that as you read it. That he's saying your name and he's saying, you don't have to be afraid. Sometimes it, it even just kind of stops me in my track to think that God would personalize that for me and say, Dave, you don't need to be afraid. Dave, you don't, you don't need to live in shame. Dave, today, I bring you good news of great joy. Put your name in it. He said, it's for you. Write this down for number two. The shepherd's invitation is my invitation. The angels made this announcement that they were giving the first and the greatest invitation the shepherds had ever seen, heard, been given. None of that had happened before. The Messiah had come. And the question was, what are you going to do? What will you do with this invitation? Later on in Jesus' ministry, he actually gives another invitation. It's in Matthew chapter 11, and I love this passage. Jesus said this, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke fits perfectly and the burden I give you is light. Can you imagine Jesus showing up at your house saying, can I come in and talk to you for a minute? And you sit down in the living room or around the kitchen table or around the island or you know whatever your house looks like. And you get a cup of coffee or you know, bottled water or something and, and you sit there and you chat a little bit and then Jesus looks at you and he says, come with me. If your soul has been weary and tired, if you've been trying and trying and trying so hard, you just don't think you can do it anymore. He says, come to me. You're carrying heavy loads, heavy burdens in your life. And he said, I will give you rest. And he says, let me teach you. Let me show you what it looks like. He says, my goal isn't to, isn't to depress you. It is not to pour on more you know, rules and regulations for you. It's not to put on such a heavy burden that you feel like I can't even do this anymore. He says, come with me and you'll find rest for your soul. Some of you don't even know what to do with a phrase like that. Rest for your souls. But see, the invitation is for us today. The Messiah has come. And so the question, of course, is what will we do with that? It's a divine interruption. It'll change your life forever. The shepherds could have made up all kinds of excuses not to go, right? We're not dressed like, we, you know, right? We, we smell like sheep. We have to watch over them. We can't leave them. What if a wolf comes? I mean, they got a million reasons why they shouldn't be leaving at this point, but they do. The wise men, is same true for them. They could have come up with even more excuses. Think about that. We have lots of important decisions in this arena that we oversee. We have to come a long distance, you know, it's too far. I mean, all those different things. But they came. And we make our excuses too. When the invitation is given to follow Jesus, it's so easy to come up with a whole host of reasons why we can't. You know, life, it's just really hard right now. I'm not good enough. I've messed up. I mean, we've, we've got all kinds of things. But listen to this. Both the wise men's lives and the lives of the shepherd were interrupted. And they responded in, in their own way, right? The wise men had gifts that they brought, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they laid those at the feet of Jesus. 
What incredible gifts to give this, this new king. But the shepherds, what did the shepherds have? Nothing except themselves. All they had was themselves. And you know what? Christ accepted both gifts. I don't know if you're aware, that's where the whole idea of giving gifts at Christmas even began. The first Christmas was the ultimate gift exchange. The wise men brought treasure, the shepherds brought themselves, and Jesus brought them both eternal life. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. The greatest gift ever. And all we have is ourselves, right? We, we, we look and, and Jesus says, just bring all that you have. And you're kidding, Jesus. I mean, look at me. I mean, I've got my past, I've got my mistakes. I mean, I've got a few little things I can do, but in the grand scheme of things, I, I, it's not even an even gift exchange, right? Because he offers so much. Have you ever been to a gift exchange and you didn't realize it was a gift exchange? Have you ever had one of those moments where someone gives you a gift and you go, hey, thank you. I don't have anything for you. You know, it, it's a really awkward place. So back when I was in high school, uh, there was this girl that I knew and we'd, we'd gone out um, just like for a movie one time. Um, she, and I was, that was just kind of not my world a lot. So I was really kind of naive, uh, but she was super nice. We were in, you know, band together and all those things. And on, on Christmas Eve, she came to my house with a gift, knocked on the door, my family's home. And she comes in and she goes, Hey, here's this gift for you. I had nothing, nothing at all. By the way, this is not Gina. Uh, I, I had nothing. And I felt so stupid. You know, it was just in that moment. It's like, you were so nice to think of me and I wasn't thinking of you at all. It was just, it was those awkward moments that are really hard. And it's kind of the same thing when, when we look at Jesus and all that he offers us and we're just sitting there going, I, I don't have anything to give you. All I have is me. And do you know, that's all that he wants. All that he wants is you. Now through this, I hope you're not thinking that you're, it's like, Dave, you're saying that if I choose to follow after Jesus, that I'll, I'll never have any problems again, that nothing will ever go wrong, there'll be no more fear in my life, that everything will just be great. Nope, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that sometimes God will save us from our problems and the issues that we may be walking through. And sometimes he saves us right in the middle of those problems, right there. But no matter which it is, you need to know that if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and you allow that interruption of him to step in, you will never be alone ever. You will be set free. You will be washed clean because that's what he's come to bring. Write this down for the last one. God's interruption is the gift of life. It probably wasn't a star that directed you here tonight, but you're here. And I believe that you were supposed to be here tonight, which I know if this is your first time or you know you're thinking, Whoa, what does that mean? I don't have any special insight. I just know that there aren't really any accidents that God's at work in all things. He's not causing all things, but he is at work in all things. And it's no accident that you're here tonight to hear a message about hope and good news and the gift of Jesus, that this Messiah, this rescuer, this savior has come. You are being interrupted this weekend for this announcement. You don't have to be afraid, but instead you can be free. In Luke 12, Jesus said this, so don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. The same Jesus that came from heaven, born in a manger, was crucified on the cross and rose three days later is the same Jesus who is here right now trying to interrupt your life, trying to interrupt your frame of reference and thought, saying, if you'll just open the door, I'll come in. The angels and the wise men accepted this invitation to come to Jesus and he accepted them. That same invitation is being given. The same interruption being given to us. Jesus is saying, hey, what do you have? Brokenness, hurt, anger? I'll take it. I'll take you. Because here's what I have for you, eternal life. 
Around here, we use this phrase a lot. We call it the great exchange. Think about this. You've done an exchange before, right? You've bought something and it's like, ah, this isn't really what I wanted. So you wanted to take it back and get something else. But what you really want for what you're turning in is value. You want some kind of similar value or even a better value if it can work. And in the great exchange, here's what happens. Jesus Christ came to this earth, born in a manger, went to a cross, gave up his life willingly and said, if you will come and bring your brokenness and your pain and your sin and your past and your shame and all of those things, I will take all of those things. And the Bible says that he paid the price for those. The penalty for that sin was done once and for all. And then here's the great exchange. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He instead gives us grace, which is what we don't deserve. And he gives us eternal life and he gives us freedom and wholeness. He gives us his love. We get the greatest exchange ever and all we bring is ourselves. I want you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray a prayer and I'm gonna ask everyone in this room just to pray it out loud with me. There's nothing magic about the words. You don't have to get it just right. But it's a prayer of faith and it's a prayer of belief. It's a prayer of, we would use this word salvation, being saved, being rescued from where we were, from the sin in our life to a relationship with God. And so maybe you're here and you're just thinking, I'm tired of trying to be good enough and trying to get it all together. And what you really want, what you really desire is what Jesus said he came to bring freedom, forgiveness, and life. So if you're here sitting in this room, no one's looking around, eyes closed, and you just say, Dave, I wanna know Jesus Christ. I wanna invite Jesus Christ into my life to be my Lord, my Savior. If that's you tonight, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see you in the back. Yeah, I see you over there. Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. And thank you for going to the cross to die for my sin. Forgive me of my past. Wash me clean. I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the gift of life. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of freedom that we don't have to live in fear, that we don't have to live bound by the past, that we don't have to live bound by the things that we've done. We don't have to live in the chains of shame anymore. But instead, Lord, we we are set free in you. God, we thank you for that message that the angels gave the shepherds all those years ago, to not be afraid and that you've come to bring good news of great joy. Lord, I pray that we would understand that, we would hold on to that, we would live in that great joy. We thank you, we love you, we honor you, we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.